Shall we bow our heads for a moment of prayer? Our gracious Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your blessings. And we ask that you give us understanding and discernment as we study some of these difficult issues in the last days. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Proverbs 16.25 says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Even with this biblical counsel, many theologians in the Christian world today are choosing an alternative theology, an emergent or emerging theology, a definition which is difficult to state. Some have described it as nailing jello to a wall. However, a lack of common belief system seems to be intentional. That is why conversation seems to be their mode of developing a thesis. First, a group discussion about what they think, and then a new theology evolves. Exploration and experimentation with anything that is new and unique, but is never quite clearly defined. This leaves the believer to dwell in shades of gray rather than in the bright light of Christ righteousness. Constantly changing shades of gray. Within the concept of emergent spirituality, there is an inherent mischief, that of constant change. The change particularly characterized by subtlety, so slight, so incremental, that it is hardly noticeable. There's always a tinge of truth, gradually evolving to who knows where. In contrast, there is within the scriptures a brightly lit path to truth. In John 8, 12, Jesus says it clearly, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. He continues saying, I am, I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. He repeats, John keeps talking about darkness compared to light. It really doesn't matter to Satan, this earthly master planner that he seems to be in these last days, how deeply a person gets into the gray, as long as Satan can lead us ever so slightly off the lighted path toward one side or the other in whatever rut and gully he can find to push us into, into his darkness. Just days before Jesus' crucifixion, he left the temple with his disciples and he walked up to the top of the Mount of Olives. Christ wept at the sight of the city, the temple, and he talked about its destruction. It was a dark time, but his disciples really didn't quite comprehend it all. And they asked Jesus, tell us when these things shall be and what shall be the sign of thy coming of the end of the world. After all their time together, I can imagine Christ must have been a bit frustrated that they still didn't understand his mission. So this time he laid it out to them quite clearly, quite graphically, not when things would happen, but he told them what would happen. Christ said these things would happen. There would be wars and rumors of wars. There would be nation against nation, famines, the beginning of sorrows, pestilences, earthquakes, affliction, killing, hatred, iniquity abounding, love waxing cold. The disciples had all seen this in their lifetime. After all, they were living under the Roman rule. But Christ described it as a great tribulation as has never been seen on earth. In the midst of this long list of dangers, he only told them one positive thing that would happen. He said the gospel will go to the whole world. And that's something to be joyful about. But despite all of these difficulties, and among all of these dangers, physical dangers, Christ repeated warnings of several spiritual deceptions that would be coming in the last days. Three specifically, he reported, would be coming. There would be false Christs. Three times he mentioned this in this chapter. He warned about false Christ. Matthew, a man accustomed to keeping books, keeping records, wrote it all down. 
reporting it three times. So it must be an important warning. False prophets, again, written down three times by Matthew. He warned, Christ warned about the false prophets, if possible, deceiving the very elect. And then he talked about fables. Unusual that someone would mention fables as a concern for deceit. But that was mentioned several times also. He concluded with a warning, be ready, for in such a time as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. We've heard these warnings, most of us, all of our lives. Could any of these apply to us? Could this mean there may be an introduction of such subtle shades of gray into our midst that we might be deceived? False Christs? Certainly we would never follow in anyone claiming to be Christ on earth. Or would we? False prophets. What is a false prophet? Anyone who stands in a pulpit or writes a book or makes a video message, anyone who speaks for God but does not follow his commandments, he or she is a false prophet. Are there any of those around? Fables, stories, partially true, partially false. Christ continued telling his disciples one of his last parables. He told them about a parable of two servants, a good servant and an evil servant, found in Matthew 24. Two servants who were to work while their master was gone. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? The faithful and wise servant is the teacher, the leader, the prophet, who is sharing the right message at the right time, as the master instructed. Blessed is that servant whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find him so doing. So doing, this is the key to the message. The servant is doing what the master asked him to do. Doing the master's will, doing it the master's way. Doing it when the master instructed the servant to do it. Christ really said very little about the good servant other than to call him blessed, which is a wonderful thing to hear from the master. But in verse 47, the master then uh, says about the good servant, Verily, I say unto you that you shall be made ruler over all goods. But Christ had a lot to say about the evil servant in verses 48 to 51. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming? How often do we hear about the three angels' message being taught? How often is revelation taught? How often do we hear a sermon about the second coming? Do we need to hear more? Continuing about the evil servant, he said, And he shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour when he is not aware of, and he shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Ellen White speaks very clearly about this evil servant as being a false shepherd. She says in early writings, I have been shown, and that's a phrase that means it's directly from God, something not to be dismissed. I have been shown that the false shepherds were drunk not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. They are drunken with error. Could that be the wine of Babylon? We have gone to Babylon to drink. And they were leading their flocks to death. Again, she says, I was shown the necessity of being separate from those who are daily imbibing in error. I saw that neither young nor old should attend their meetings. In our efforts to be inclusive, the favorite catchword these days often seems to be inclusive. To be, uh, include everyone is good, but to include every new idea that comes along can be very dangerous. In our effort to be inclusive, have we embraced theologies tinged with gray? Interestingly enough, 
two weeks ago, I was talking with a pastor friend of mine. He had just recently preached on this very subject, on the necessity of being separate from the world, just as the Bible tells us to do. He cited both the scripture and the spirit of prophecy. And he told me that within just a couple of days, he received five different phone calls from people, not members of his own church, but those who had seen his sermon on the local 3ABN channel. People chastising him for speaking about being separate from the world. Four out of those five who called were local university professors. And yet another pastor, just a few miles away, posted this message on his website. Theologies of separatism are heresies with dangerous consequences. Now, who do we follow? The scriptures or the professors? Ellen White continues, I saw then neither young nor old should attend their meetings. God is displeased with us when we go to listen to error without being obliged to go. For unless he sends us, that means God sending us to those meetings, he will not keep us. The angels cease their watchful care over us, and we are left to the buffetings of the enemy, that's Satan, to be darkened and weakened by him and the power of his evil angels. And the light around us becomes contaminated with darkness. It's from early writings. What do false prophets, teachers, and preachers do for us? Ellen White spells it out quite clearly. False prophets lead the minds to fables. Remember Christ mentioned fables to his disciples? Something to remember. False prophets have not made up a hedge that the people of God may stand in the battle of the day of the Lord. So the false prophets are not giving protection to their people by teaching them the right so they can stand strong in the days of difficulty. The false prophets take the easiest and best manner to affect their object and to quiet the minds of inquiring ones. The false prophets deny the past teachings of God. They deny the glorious truths that they once zealously advocated. The false prophets are drunken with error and leading their flocks to death. Here, Ellen White urges that we have no time to throw away in listening to fables. That's twice she mentions fables in just a brief short time. The scripture mentions it twice in Matthew 24. I wonder why we keep hearing that. We'll get there in a moment. If God has any new light to communicate, he will let his chosen and beloved understand it without their going to have their minds enlightened by hearing those who are in darkness and error. That's again in early writings, page 124. I mentioned the term inclusive a moment ago. To show the trend of inclusiveness in other churches during the last few years, here's a brief commentary from an article entitled The Changing State of Spirituality from an issue of The American, a Roman Catholic journal. Here are some key observations by this Catholic journal about the trends in book publishing over the last 20 years. The top 10 books were about spirituality, predominantly from authors attempting to, um, to apply Eastern religious teachings to spirituality. They also incorporated psychology into spirituality. The new theology, or the emergent theology, is free to draw upon any teaching in order to achieve its goal. Any teaching, that's pretty inclusive, isn't it? This concept opens the door wide to changes, allowing theology to be shaped to accommodate culture, any kind of culture. We wouldn't want to hurt anyone's feelings by denying them their culture. It accommodates an erosion of biblical pillars of faith, the pillars of faith that were established when our church was begun based on the scripture. It allows for opinions to define theology. In other words, the Bible is not considered an infallible source of truth. People may pick and choose the most personally comfortable beliefs and ignore those 
that require real change in lifestyle, a bit like a smorgasbord. The question is, are these emergent accommodations affecting our, us as Seventh-day Adventists in our own church? Are there shades of gray being introduced, shared, and then retained? Do we follow their leaders, read their books, quote, from our, quote them from our pulpits, invite them to our pulpits? There are three key emergent church leaders I'm going to point out here. There are many, many more than these three, but these are three key ones. Uh, Doug Paget, Brian McLaren, and Tony Jones. If we are to listen to these leaders, and many within our church are, we should know where they're going. When asked where the emergent church is going, each of them gave unique answers, and these are their own words. First, from Doug Paget. This is what he says in his own words. Mystery is not the enemy to be conquered or a problem to be solved, but rather a partner with whom we must dance. And dance we must. The call, what we believe, is to dance and play the music. We would certainly be under-providing if we didn't offer a new way to enter and live in mystery. So he's offering to provide new, a new a, a commodity. Otherwise, he would be under-providing or not satisfying his followers. Do we want to live in mystery? How does mystery coincide with the message of the scriptures? Notice within the structure of this old church, Doug Paget is, uh, is where he is sitting. Uh, does it look like your traditional church? Things have changed a little bit, haven't they? There are no pews, there's no platform, uh, there are sofas, coffee tables, even some food. It's kind of a theater in the round in which Paget presents his mysteries. What does the Bible say about mysteries? Amos 3, 7, Surely the Lord God will do nothing but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. God reveals what we need to know through his word. No secrets necessary. So we have a choice. Do we do as Doug Paget urges? Follow him and dance with a mystery or follow the word of God? Another emergent leader in his own words. This is talking, uh, using the words here of Brian McLaren concerning the emergent church. Where is it going? All participants, the emergents, agree on their disillusionment with the institutional church, but we do not all agree where the church is destined to go from here. So even the emergent leaders don't agree on a destination. Why would we follow a leader who does not know where he's going? We know that our destination is sure if we follow God's word. John says in Revelation 21.1, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Isn't it wiser? To follow a leader who knows that ultimate destination? Emergent leader Tony Jones states where the emergent church is leading. He says it very, very simply. We don't know. It's a messy endeavor, and I embrace the messiness. I was particularly taken by his statement attached to his own picture. If you can see on the side back here to my right. How to be a Christian without believing what Christians believe. This message of messiness, how does that message resonate with the scripture? Does it make you confident that they are leading us where we need to go? And how does God order things in his house? 1 Corinthians 14, 40 says, Let all things done be done decently and in order. Three key leaders, three very different messages. Paget present a new way to live in mystery. McLaren states emergence, agree on disillusionment, but disagree on destination. Jones just says it's messy. So whom do we follow? The light of the scriptures or the nebulous gray of a self-described messy mystery which seems to be rudderless.
There's one more emergent church leader that I would like to tell you about. And these are from the words of Shane Claiborne. He says, for those of us who have nearly given up the church, may we take comfort in the words of St. Augustine. The church is a whore, but she's my mother. Claiborne continues, she's a mess and has many illegitimate children, but she's also our mama. Is that a confident message to follow? This young emergent preacher, author, Shane Claiborne, was invited to Walla Walla University about a year and a half ago. He was given full access to the church pulpit for an entire weekend, Friday night, all Sabbath services, even staying in a house where university students lived. A speaker who is in such demand that scheduling Claiborne's visit took nearly two years to arrange. A friend of mine and I went to his first meeting, the Vespers, on Friday night. We found seats in the back of the church and sat down in total darkness. There was a single spotlight highlighting the musicians at the front, and then the music began. I must clarify that the darkness and the, the rock music was not something Shane Claiborne brought with him. Uh, it's not unusual for Vespers at the university to be in darkness. But it did continue throughout the evening when Shane Claiborne did speak later. But my friend and I chose to slip out quietly out the back door until the music was finished. And it gave us a unique opportunity to talk to some of Claiborne's people who were setting up tables to display their promotional materials, their brochures, books, DVDs in the narthex of the church. We spoke with them briefly and asked about their beliefs, and they assured us that all they do is introduce people to Jesus, just Jesus. They assured us that Claiborne's ministry does not evangelize. There's no church affiliation. We are ecumenical. They seem to think we would be happy with that concept of them being ecumenical. And then I had to ask one last question as we were about to go back inside and listen to Claiborne speak. I asked one of the men who was setting things up, I said, what is your goal, your ministry's goal in coming here to Walla Walla University? And his response was this, we are here to recruit your students to come and work for our ministry. Our preachers invite emergent leaders to teach our youth. Emergent leaders attempt to recruit our youth to join with them. Who is teaching whom? Emergents are after our youth. Remember, emergents are young. Often described as postmodernists, millennials, generation Xers, etc. Their leaders are completely unconcerned about old folks like me and maybe a few of you out there that might be my age. They don't care what we think. They are seeking specifically the youth. Since that is the case, should we be inviting them to teach our youth or even us as adults? But that's in just one church. He's been to others of our universities. Let's look in another direction here. A couple of years ago, a friend of mine shared with me some information from a Seventh-day Adventist website. You know, nearly every church has a website these days. It's so very convenient for a pastor to share information and uh, all sorts of things with his people and others from around the world who want to know what's going on in our major churches. And uh, this website that she sent me a copy of, it had a listing that seemed a little strange to me at first. I looked at it and it said, 11 new ways to pray. And as I read through the 11 new ways to pray, most everything looked pretty good. But two particularly popped out at me, two items on this list. I noted number six of the 11 new ways to pray simply suggested silence. There was no mention of be still and know that I am God, the kind of silence we know from Psalms 46.10, but just silence. And then it recommended reading some of the writings from Henry Nouwen. Now, who is Henry Nouwen? 
He's a well-known Catholic mystic whose book tells us of his using contemplative prayer and encourages the practice of going into the silence. So my question was, do we follow the teachers, teachings of Henry Nouwen and this new way to pray? The second item on the list of 11 new ways to pray, I noticed, was number nine. It merely stated, Lectio Divina. So what's Lectio Divina? Lectio Divina is an ancient meditative practice of spiritual reading, taken from the spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola. It became regular practice in monasteries about the time of St. Benedict in the sixth century. So it's not really a new way to pray, but a very ancient way to pray. Three years ago, Lectio Divina was announced to the world by Pope Benedict, the Pope just before Francis. And he announced it as being the foremost evangelistic tool to bring people back to the Mother Church. I remember the day vividly. This announcement happened on a day that would have been my mother's 100th birthday. That was on 10, 11, 12, October 11, 2012. I remember thinking this announcement on my mother's birthday. What would my mother think of this? So my question then again was, a minute ago, you know, do we follow Henry Nouwen? And now this next one, do we follow the Pope? This is what the Pope is saying we should do, and this is what this church website is telling us to do. That's a new way to pray. It really seemed, seemed strange that both of these issues should be on a, a church website, an Adventist church website. So I wrote a little note to the pastor asking about number six and number nine on this list. And I asked the question, do we follow Henry Nouwen? Do we follow the Pope? The pastor, being very busy and heading up one of our largest churches, sent me a quick note back and said his assistant would follow up with the answers to my questions. So the assistant's response was also gracious, and she assured me they would never do anything that was not in accordance with the scriptures and that she would look into it. So I pressed her a little further and I said, well, can you tell me the source of this list of 11 new ways to pray? No one in their office seemed to know what the source of that list was. Either they couldn't find it or didn't know or they just didn't, didn't have an answer for me. So the next day I checked the Pioneer Memorial Church website and the list of 11 new ways to pray was gone. In its place was a slightly shorter list entitled, Nine New Ways to Pray. Was there an intent to mislead or deceive? I have no way of knowing. But I suspect it may have been an example of what I call copy and paste theology. I suspect somebody happened to read a list of 11 new ways to pray somewhere, and at first glance it looked good. But looking good can be dangerous. I would suggest first, and this is my own little motto, verify all you see and hear with the scriptures. Verify all you see and hear with the scriptures. Here's a quick personal example from my own life. I go on Facebook occasionally, not a lot, but I signed up about a year ago. Actually, I had one of my sons do it for me because I had no clue how to set it up. Uh, but I checked on one day, uh, and, and I, as I was scrolling down, I, I found a nice statement. Um, it was nicely framed. It was well written. It had a wonderful message. And it was this. A lie doesn't become truth. A wrong doesn't become right. An evil doesn't become good just because it's accepted by the majority. Now, that's a profound statement, isn't it? Especially when so many are being swayed by the majority on so many strange issues. I even thought about including it in this talk, but there was no author indicated. So I assumed maybe it's by this famous author, Anonymous, that so many quote. And then I decided to apply my own personal criteria, verify all you see and hear with the scriptures. I knew it wasn't scriptural, but it was good, and I really wanted to use it. So I thought, how am I going to find out where this came from? Well, the simple way, Google it. 
So I did. Imagine my surprise. This was written by Pastor Rick Warren, one of the most famous emergent church leaders, founder and senior pastor of Saddleback Church, a megachurch in, in Lake Forest, California, eighth largest church in the United States, best known author for many, many Christian books. Many of our own pastors go to his conferences for their training. Would I choose to use a quotation from Rick Warren? It was a good statement, wasn't it? A good quote, but what else does he teach? An emergent and ecumenical message? A combination of truth and error? Do you know how he initially established what became his megachurch in Forest Lake, California? He circulated a questionnaire to the community where he wanted to establish his church, asking people what they wanted in a church. Based on the preferences of the people, he fashioned his church in the style of music they wanted, in the style of service they wanted, even the message that they wanted. Is that a solid foundation? So I chose not to use this quotation. Not in this talk, at least not in the way I'd initially intended. And decided to stick with my own criteria. Verify all you see and hear. And then go back to Isaiah 8.20, unto the law and the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Was it a good saying? Yes. Is it true? Yes. Should I use it? What does this author say on other pages that he has written? If there is truth on one page and error in another, should I share that quote with anyone and possibly introduce someone else to error? not according to Isaiah 8.20. There are leaders among us who, at the mere suggestion of avoiding the writings of emergent authors, cry loudly to reclaim our libraries, attaching a label of well-intentioned but misguided fringes to those who choose to set aside emergent books. Speaking just for myself, I personally would not want to be responsible for introducing anyone to the error in the books, in any books that might lead anyone away from the scriptures. It may seem insignificant to some, it may seem radical to some, but it may be crucial for eternity. Note that in the reviews article, the author highlighted a single statement for special attention. A tiny minority of Adventists is now wielding unwarranted influence on the church's educational, pastoral, and publishing ministries. This caustic response at the mere mention by a few who urge the avoidance of emergent and unbiblical books, if I might call them books of another order. Ellen White speaks about these books of another order. In Our High Calling, page 276, Age after age, the curiosity of men has led them to seek for the tree of knowledge, and often, they often think they are plucking fruit most essential, when like Solomon, they find it altogether vanity and nothing. Books from the pens of infidels. Now let's stop for a minute. What is an infidel? It's a seemingly harsh word that we don't hear very often today in our circles. I chose the simplest dif uh, dictionary definition. Actually, it's a definition for kids. An infidel is a person who does not believe in a certain religion. Do we believe in a certain religion based on the word of God? So an infidel is someone who is not a believer. Let's go back to what Mrs. White is saying. Books from the pens of infidels should have no place in the libraries of those who would serve God. Men have studied these books from Satan's inspiration, and they have become confused in regard to what the truth was. Satan stands by the side of him who opens an infidel book, and he, Satan, will educate the mind. So bewitch the soul that it will be almost impossible to break the infatuation. 
Let no believer flatter himself that his mountain standeth sure and that he will never be moved away from his position of faith. Those who value their soul's salvation should shun infidel writings as they would shun leprosy. That to me is a powerful statement. And then again, this quote, there is to be no compromise with those who make void the law of God. It is not safe to rely upon them as counselors. You are not to look to the world in order to learn what you shall write and publish and what you shall speak. Let all your words and uh, works testify. They have not followed cunningly devised fables. Mrs. White quotes Peter here about fables. So we're getting to the fable aspect of what's going on. About a year and a half ago, I met a delightful young lady when I was attending an ASI convention in Grand Rapids, Michigan. During lunch on the second day of that huge, in that huge dining comments, commons where they quickly served thousands of people each day, uh, I was ushered to a seat next to a young lady I had never seen before, at least not in person, but whom I immediately recognized. She was Melody Mason. I had seen her several times on 3ABN talking about prayer, and I thanked her for her ministry. When I introduced myself, I was surprised she recognized my name from just a little article that I'd written a few months before. So we began chatting immediately. She was excited about the publication of her very first book, which was just days away from distribution, a book entitled Daring to Ask for More, a book about prayer. She told me how in the process of researching her writing, she had read other books on prayer, but there was one that concerned her. It was a book that was filled with very good stories and very good texts and lots of illustrations that just seemed so good. But, and she'd even intended to put some of these things in her book, excerpting from the other book and put those in, quoting those in hers because they were so good. But then at the last minute, she was compelled to pull those things out of publication. She said something just wasn't right. And so it piqued my curiosity. She asked me, she said, would you, would you have a look at that book and then give me an idea as to what it's all about? And I said, sure. So when I got home, I did my usual thing, which is order a used copy, 98 cents plus postage at amazon.com. And soon the book was on its way to me. The name of the book is called The Circle Maker by Mark Batterson. I'd never heard of it before. Once it arrived in my mailbox, and before I even opened it up, I was on the phone with a long distance friend, and she said, well, they just started using that book at my, at my prayer meeting at my church. And she says, and I heard about it being advertised as a featured book at the winter NAD prayer conference. So what could possibly be wrong with it? Now, my curiosity was piqued again. First of all, Mark Batterson is an emergent preacher and author, lead pastor for a national community church in Washington, DC, church in eight locations, huge ministry. He holds his doctorate in ministry from Regent University on the New York best time selling list uh, with 11 books. Six of those books are for adults and several smaller ones for children, and they're all based on one thing. It's a new way to pray. Have you heard this phrase before? There's always someone introducing a new way to pray. His new way to pray is taken from an ancient story called The Legend of the Circle Maker. The author describes his search through the Book of Legends as akin to an archeological dig and finding a buried treasure from the first century BC. He found an obscure story amid the oral traditions of the ancient rabbis repeated from generation to generation through the centuries. Now first, what's the definition of a legend? A legend is a story from the past which is believed by many people but cannot be proved to be true, kind of like a fable, so would this be biblical? Let's talk about Hani the circle maker. Hani is the name of the man 
who was the circle maker. He was described by some as an eccentric sage. Some said he was even holy. The man was said to have performed many good deeds by using his extraordinary powers of prayer and performing miracles. Batterson, the author of this book, after digging up these ancient works, now holds up Hani in his book as a man to be emulated and to follow his new way of praying. Well, it didn't take too many keystrokes for me to find out a little bit more about Hani, and I didn't have to go digging into any dusty, cobwebby places to find it. A quick two-minute Google search told me more about the legend of Hani. Um, at one point in his life, Hani is, is said to have slept for 70 years. Does this sound like a credible story? Maybe a fable? He slept for 70 years, and upon awakening, he prayed to God for death rather than live in such a strange new world. But somehow the author didn't seem fit, uh, didn't see fit to include that in the information about the book. Again, I say it's important to verify the source of your material. But the legend of Hani is told like this. Once there was a terrible drought in the land of Israel. No rain had fallen all winter long. So the people sent for Hani, famous for his ability to pray for rain. At first he prayed and no rains came. Then with his six foot staff in hand, Batterson dramatically tells, uh, and I quote, Hani began to turn like a math compass. His circular mo movement was rhythmical and methodical. 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, 360 degrees. Hani stood inside the circle, and then he dropped to his knees and raised his hands to heaven. He cried out, Lord of the universe, I swear by your great name, I will not move from this circle until you have shown me your mercy upon your children for rains that will fill the cisterns and pits and caverns. And then the rains came. The circle he drew in the sand became a sacred symbol to the Jewish people. And the legend of Hani stands as a testament to the power of a single prayer that changed the course of Israel's history. To this day in northern Israel, visitors to his grave honor the tradition of his sand circle by walking in circles around his tombstone. Based on the legend of Hani, and the back cover of his book, Mark Batterson promises he will, quote, teach you how to pray a new way by drawing prayer circles around your dreams, around your family, around your problems, and most importantly, around God's promises. Batterson is talking about literal circles, like Hani is purported to have drawn in the sand. Batterson urges people to literally circle promises in your Bible, circle life goals, walk in circles around property you wish to acquire, standing in circles you draw and insist on an answer. He even equates Jericho as an example of circle making to substantiate his Hani legend thesis. One man has even taken to circling the country. He's going to walk around the entire perimeter of the United States to make things better for the country. Batterson claims, if you keep circling the promises, God will ultimately deliver on it. Is that a guarantee? Does God not have control as to how he answers prayer? God's prayers are prophecies. Or excuse me, prayers are prophecies. If they are prophecies, then that makes God powerless. And nowhere in the book did I find a thy will be done connected to a prayer. It seems to be my will be done, rather. Well-defined prayers result in a well-defined life. It's a form of prosperity gospel, a gospel of personal acquisition, with Batterson's motto, Dream big, pray hard, think long. If circles 
were a necessary component to effective prayer. Don't you think Jesus would have shared this in information with us before now? Rather than having Batterson dig through dusty manuscripts to find an ancient Jewish legend? The entire premise of this book and the other five that he wrote is based on a legend. And what were we warned about? According to the scriptures, Paul speaking to Titus regarding the people he was leading, he said, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. And from Mrs. White, I saw that we should have no time to throw away listening to fables. Our minds should not be diverted thus. But wasn't it promoted at an NAD prayer conference? Could it be used in other places? Is this another new way to pray that Adventists need? Upon further study, um, the witchcraft around the world has common things in which there is a casting the circle as part of its tradition. Um, makes me wonder how that might fit in. But let's go back to this previous website uh, where we originally found those 11 new ways to pray. Uh, there's a two-part sermon there entitled Circle Maker. And it focuses on a Jewish legend, the legend of Hani. So we find this in church. As those walking into church walk down, the, down between the pews, we see on the left, up here on the screen, they must walk through large white circles that are strewn in the aisles. We see the pastor as he points to the large white circle hanging high from the ceiling. The pastor stands in the middle of a white circle as he preaches about the message of Hani in two sermons to his congregation. What did we just read? Not giving heed to Jewish fables and the commandments of men that turn from the truth? But it appears Hani was not the first not the first nor the last to do circles and prayers. Religious traditions around the world have commonly used casting a circle as part of tradition. The aboriginals of Australia use circles in their magical rituals for the purpose of cursing enemies. The Wicca, a form of witchcraft, casts circles to create a sacred space in which to celebrate worship of their gods and goddesses. Chalk-drawn circles are used in old Bohemia as both protective devices and a place from which to conduct acts of magic. Slaves brought from the Caribbean, uh, to the Caribbean from Africa were revered and often feared because of their magical abilities. Some drawing the magic circle with a special kind of chalk made from white eggshells. Are you seeing any shades of gray here? What about the literal darkness that many talk about within the emergent church? It's not just spiritual darkness, it's literal darkness. This is Dan Kimball, another emergent leader. He's a graduate of George Fox University under the mentorship of Leonard Sweet. And he defines in his book changes that need to be made in the literal, physical environment where we worship today. According to Kimball, we should be returning to a no-holds-barred approach to worship and teaching so that when we gather, there is no doubt that we are in the presence of God. We are talking about setting a new atmosphere. Quoting from his book, user-friendly and contemporary must change. It must change to experiential and spiritual and mystical. Many emergent churches already use user-friendly techniques of round tables for discussion or sofas or easy chairs in the round, casual comfort being the intended mood, like we saw in the picture of Doug Paget's church a little bit ago. But Kimball is advocating a change from that even. Kimball continues, lit up and cheery sanctuaries need to be darkened because darkness is valued 
and displays a sense of spirituality. Literal darkness is valued. Who put a value on darkness? John 3.19 says, Light is come into this world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. During the past year, I've had two people get in touch with me from the same church. Not a church in my state, but from a few hundred miles away. One sought me out with an email and wrote to me in detail about the changes that have occurred in her church, her Seventh-day Adventist church, since they got a brand new pastor. Now they have a rock band. They've never had one before. Now they have darkening shades. Never had those before. Now the interior of the sanctuary has been painted a very dark color. Never had that before. Many services are now performed entirely in the dark. I'd never had dark services before. She asked me what to do. A few months later, another lady from the very same church who had been traveling to my state to visit friends stopped by my town and gave me a call and asked if we could meet. So we did. She described to me exactly those same churches, exactly those same changes that had taken place in her church. The church must be changed so that the focal point of the service is a holistic experience. This is what the emergent church is after. We are talking experiential rather than biblical. We are talking less word, less of the word of God. Less light, less literal, more darkness, more literal darkness. Again, Dan Kimball's words, in the emerging culture, darkness represents spirituality. We see this in Buddhist temples, as well as Catholic and Orthodox churches. Darkness communicates that something serious is happening. This is from his book, Emerging Church, page 136. This is not unusual teaching for the emergent. This is a typical emergent teaching. If you would now, I'd like you to use your imagination for me for just a few moments. It's a beautiful spring day. The sun is shining, it's Sabbath, and we walk into a large Seventh-day Adventist church. Not an emergent church, but a Seventh-day Adventist church. It's a church with a membership of about 2,400 members. It's filled with a congregation of local community members and a university student body. The scripture is read. The hymns are sung. The prayers are prayed. The children have their story, and then the pastor steps onto the platform. The pastor begins to speak. And I want you to note that every word from his sermon that I have in quotes is a direct quote from his words. The pastor begins to speak about prayer, about closing our eyes, about being in darkness, about Jesus' habit of praying in darkness. As he speaks, the lights in the church slowly dim, and we notice that the shades are being adjusted to create a darkened, totally darkened sanctuary. We remember that even the tiny vertical windows in the doors at the rear of the sanctuary when we entered were covered with tape and black paper. The pastor calmly assures the congregation that this is, quote, not to be cute or clever, but that thinking about prayer in the dark will help to understand why Jesus valued it so. My question, where does Jesus say that he valued the dark? I have searched, and I can't find any reference to say Jesus valued the dark. But the pastor says he did. As the congregation is gradually submerged into darkness, some small children are a bit disturbed, become a little restless, fuss a bit, and have to be taken out. And then the pastor, a master wordsmith, a skilled orator, known for his ability to memorize entire sermon, begins to speak. The lights have gone out, and the 
congregation is in complete darkness for the next 22 minutes. He begins in Genesis with creation, urging the congregation to, and I quote, think of the presence of darkness there. The pastor said, God creates out of the darkness, day one. God creates light, but also affirms darkness. My question, where is the biblical reference where God affirms darkness? There is none. The scripture says, Genesis 1, 3 to 4, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light and said that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. The pastor continued speaking about the creation week. The pastor says, the seventh day begins at sunset, at the beginning of darkness. The first half of Sabbath lived in pitch black of night. The scripture says, Genesis 2, 2 and 3, it describes Sabbath creation. And on the Sabbath, seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all of his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. No reference to pitch blackness of night. The scripture paints a picture of rest, a blessed sanctified time. The pastor paints the Sabbath as in darkness, the pitch black of night. Genesis 1, 31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Continuing on, the pastor speaks of the children of Israel. The pastor said, God leads the children of Israel through the waters of a parted sea at night. The scripture says something a little different. Exodus 14, 19 to 20, it says, The pillar of cloud came between the camp of the Egyptian and the camp of Israel. It was a cloud and the darkness to them, darkness to the Egyptians, but it gave light by night to the Israelites. The pastor completely omits the biblical reference to light given by God to guide them safely across that part of the sea. God did not leave his people in darkness. He provided them with a pillar of light to guide them through that sea. Continuing on, the pastor says, Moses ascends the mountain to hear the word from the Lord. And we are told a dark cloud shrouds the mountain, leaving the people, as it were, kept in the dark. Genesis 20, 1 to 3 says, God spake these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. As God etched his law in stone, his Ten Commandments, God's chosen people were at the foot of the mountain, protected by a cloud, not kept in the dark. God never leaves his people in the dark, as it were, kept in the dark. Now, gradually, while still sitting in darkness, the congregation sees at first a tiny bit of light. White letters fade onto the black screen, and this quote appears. This darkness and cloud is always between you and God, no matter what you do, and it prevents you from seeing him clearly by the light of your reason and from experiencing him in sweetness of love and in your affection. So set yourself at rest in this darkness as long as you can, always crying out after him whom you love. For if you are to experience him or see him at all, in so far as it is possible here, we must always be in this cloud and in this darkness. This is taken from a quotation from the book, The Cloud of Unknowing. What is this strange cloud the pastor is talking about? Certainly not one sent from God. One who tells us we cannot see him clearly by the light of our own reason. Who is telling us to rest in darkness as long as you can? What is the cloud of unknowing? The book? The Cloud of Unknowing, it's a document written by an anonymous monk in the latter half of the 14th century. 
Scholars describe this book as full of the best and brightest teachings of the mystical desert fathers of old, written at the height of European monasticism. It teaches techniques used by the medieval monastic community to build and maintain a contemplative knowledge of God. Its underlying message urges that the only way to know, to truly know God, is to abandon all preconceived notions of, and beliefs or knowledge about God. Does that make sense to us as Christians? We need to be, he continues, to be courageous enough to surrender your mind and your ego to the realm of unknowingness, at which point you begin to glimpse the nature of the true God. Who is asking you to surrender your mind without reason, without knowing? Who wants to deceive you? Who is the prince of darkness? The writings of an anonymous monk preached in a Seventh-day Adventist church, a Seventh-day Adventist darkened church, urging people to rest in darkness as long as you can. Remember the parable we talked about earlier? The false teachers? Christ said, be ye not deceived. And then the screen goes dark again. The pastor continues, close your eyes when you pray, because in the darkness you shall see even more clearly. Where is this yearning from darkness of darkness coming from? Do you sense an agenda here? The scripture says, 1 John 1, 5, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. John 12, 46, I am come in light unto the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And yet here we sit, still in a dark church. The pastor says there is something about the night that brings forth communication with God and severs the divide between the human and the divine. He continues with a narrative that starts in the Old Testament. He talks about things that happened to Abraham at night, Jacob at night, Joseph at night, Samson, Samuel, Daniel, Jonah, in the New Testament of Paul, of the things that happened in the New Testament, the fact that Jesus was born at night, the shepherds watched their flocks by night, the Magi followed the stars at night, Joseph was told by the angel at night that he should go ahead and marry Mary. All of these scenarios, the pastor walks through affirming the darkness. Why? He continues, close your eyes when you pray. Close your eyes when you pray, for we, not, we walk not by sight, but by faith. That's good. Close your eyes when you pray, because we see God. We taste God. The biblical record suggests, according to the pastor, the biblical record suggests we experience God more acutely in the darkness. In darkness, you can be closer to God. Nowhere in the biblical record is such a statement made, but he presents it as truth to his entire congregation. Astronomy today reveals that the earth revolves once every 24 hours. Therefore, half of our lives are lived without benefit of direct sunlight. Does that establish that we experience God more acutely, more closely in the dark? Isaiah 5.20, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness. The pastor continues. He references the author Barbara Brown Taylor, a renowned Episcopal preacher. But he does not name her book. But I will, because you need to know what he's reading from. The book that he is referring to is called Learning to Walk, in the dark. Brown Taylor asks us to put aside our fears and anxieties and to explore all that God has to teach us in the dark. Through darkness, she says, we find courage. 
We understand the world in new ways, and we feel God's presence around us, guiding us through things seen and unseen. God dwells in deep darkness. God comes to people in dark clouds, dark nights, dark dreams, and dark strangers. God does some of God's best work in the dark. Based on the witness of those who have gone before, the dark cloud is where God takes people apart so that they can be made new. It is the cloud of unknowing where nothing you thought you knew about, God can prepare you to meet the, law, the God who is. It is the dark womb where life begins anew, at least for those who are willing to lift up the veil. Is this good news or bad news? That's up to you. This is Barbara Brown Taylor. Inside this cloud, strange things happen. But the pastor says of her writings, her writings, speaking of Barbara Brown Taylor, have blessed me on the value of darkness. He again reiterates, close your eyes with prayer, this sweet hour of prayer. And then there was complete silence and complete darkness for an additional two minutes. And the service ended. It's interesting because when you go into Barbara Brown Taylor's writings, we find an identical sermon structure in Barbara Brown Taylor's book, identical in format to what the pastor presented. With an emphasis on darkness throughout both the Old and the New Testament, the same sermon structure, it was featured in Time magazine on the very same weekend that the pastor presented this scenario. This was not a Seventh-day Adventist sermon. This was an Episcopal sermon excerpted from the writings of Barbara Brown Taylor. She's listed among the 100 most influential people in the world today. Good credentials, but not Seventh-day Adventist credentials. Yet the pastor states, her writings have blessed me on the value of darkness. Is this not yet another form of copy and paste theology? The great controversy says on page 587, it is one of Satan's devices to combine with falsehood just enough truth to give it plausibility. Satan is constantly endeavoring to attract attention to man in place of God. He leads people to look to the bishops, to the pastors, to the professors of theology as their guides, instead of searching the scriptures to learn their duty for themselves. Then, by controlling the minds of these leaders, he can influence the multitudes according to his will. Great Controversy 595. As Christ warned his disciples, take heed that no man deceive you. We need that same warning today. Now, I'm very fortunate to have a pastor at my church, a state line Seventh-day Adventist church, who preaches from the Bible every week with all the lights on. Once a month, without fail, he reads a very brief statement to us as a congregation. The moment he begins this statement, there is an immediate hush in our congregation because we know and appreciate what he's about to say. This is what he says to us. The Bible is the fully inspired word of God. It is the infallible revelation of his will. It is the authoritative revealer of doctrine. And it is the trustworthy record of God's acts in history. Prayerfully and humbly read and study the Bible more. For in it we will find hope for every crisis. And more importantly, we will find our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died to redeem us from our sins. Verify all you see and hear with the scriptures. Determine you will follow only in the direction that those scriptures lead. Listen to God's voice no matter what other voices you may hear. Each of us has an individual choice to make every day. I pray that none of us will be deceived by the darkness of the world, by the gray of emergent teachings, 
or the deepening shadows which are being cast within our own house. Thank you.